I wanted to talk about smoking. I've had relatives, patients, co-workers that died because of smoking. It's too many to talk about. So I'm just going to talk about one particular patient. He was in his 80s. He had a stroke because of the very heavy cigarette smoking. He didn't die. But he could not do anything. He was in bed. He could not speak. He could not swallow. He could not move. But he was totally aware. He was being taken care of at home in the little apartment by his wife, who was also in her 80s, and her sister, her unmarried sister, who was also in her 80s. They had a visiting nurse, which was me. He needed to be suctioned every day. That's sticking a small tube a little below the throat and getting the mucus out. The agency wanted to have them learn how to do it because the government doesn't pay indefinitely, but they were scared. They were a different generation than me, maybe even two generations away from me. I was in my so I was in my 30s at the time. Anyway, they were only a few blocks from my house. It was very easy to go there. They were so gracious. They were very poor, but always offered me, you know, do you want something? You need something to eat? Do you need some water? I even brought my sons over there to visit. It was easy to like them. They were sweet. They were funny. So the man who was in the bed, he had to be bathed. Not by me, I was the nurse. The, sis the sister and his wife bathed him every day. He couldn't move, they had to turn him over. So picture this man, totally aware, totally unable to move, and he knows, he knows that his sister-in-law is helping his wife bathe him. He must have been embarrassed. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, these little sticks with a tiny little sponge at the end and they're in hospitals and you dip them in, in water or mouthwash or something and you use it to clean the patient's mouth, a patient who can't brush their teeth and you can't brush their teeth for them because they'll just choke on it. They can't, they can't spit out the uh, the mouthwash or the toothpaste. So his wife used to take this little stick with this little sponge on the end and since she remembered that he loved cola she used to dip the little sponge in some cola and she would put it in his mouth so he could taste the flavor. And she knew she could tell that he was tasting it. But it was such a tiny amount that it wouldn't need to be swallowed. She also did the same thing with Cuban coffee, which he used to love. She would dip that little sponge with the stick in the Cuban coffee, a tiny bit, and she'd put it in his mouth, all around his mouth, so he could have the flavor of Cuban coffee. They were Catholics, so every once in a while, the Catholic priest would come visit them in the house. And he'd say a blessing and a prayer over the man. And I think he even gave him communion, like maybe a tiny piece of it that that, that wouldn't um, get swallowed, that would just melt in his mouth. And every time the priest came, the man in the bed, he, he couldn't move anything, not even his face, not even an expression, but tears tears would come out of his eyes. So for many reasons we knew he was totally aware. So here's the thing. If, if you don't mind dying, you, you figure, well, I'm, I want to enjoy everything including my cigarette, so I die. Here's my question. 
What if you don't die? What if you're like my patient? And here's the other thing. Do you know how long he was in that bed, being bathed by his wife and his sister-in-law, crying when the priest came, licking a, having a sponge in his mouth so he could take, taste cola and Cuban coffee? Ten years. I wasn't working with him ten years. I was there. I got the patient towards the end. Ten years like that, laying in the bed. You can't move, but you're totally aware. You're you're just you're a prisoner in your body. I never forgot these people. And all of a sudden, while I was taking care of them, my boss, my very nice boss, told me that the government is not going to continue sending a nurse there because the wife and the sister should learn how to suction the patient. They couldn't, they were so scared. They were old and they, they weren't people that were used to complicated medical procedures and modern things like that. They were afraid that they'd hurt him. So when the patient's wife and sister found out, they asked me. They said, Keep in mind, I lived a few blocks from them. Can you still come and we'll pay you? I like these people very much. I said, I don't want any money. I just live a few blocks from here. It takes me less than five minutes to come here. And at this point, he needed suctioning every day. I didn't mind. These were my neighbors. This, these were such lovely people. I said, no, I don't want any money. And they couldn't handle that, not giving me anything. So I said, well, how about just fix me a little bit of that wonderful Cuban food I, I love that you made. You know, the black beans or, um, or the squash or the pump, pumpkin casserole, all kinds of stuff. Wonderful. And I said, this will help me more than money, because I have money. I don't have time to do all that cooking. I don't even have time to, to go get takeout. You give me that, that little bowl, and I'll be happy with it. The next thing I had to do was ask the doctor, the head doctor for the agency, if legally I'm allowed to still go there, you know, on my own. Uh, I was licensed, of course. I said, is there any problem if I keep going to their house and, and doing this and suctioning him every day? And he said, the only problem is for your pocketbook because you're not getting paid. So it was okay with, with the doctor of the agency. So that's what I did for a long time, very long time until I think I, I moved away from there. And that's why I stopped stop seeing them. Um, and by that time, they, they had found some other solution to the problem. And one time, one time they brought me a, they bought me a small broiler. I don't know how they found out. I didn't have a broiler. And I didn't like microwaves, but whatever, conversation. But um, eventually, I, you know, I kept in touch with them, and eventually the man died. And the two sisters moved to a better place. Um, and that's, that's the story. So think about it. Think about that question. What if you don't die? I, I had another patient. I didn't want to talk about her. <laughs> but she was a ballerina in Cuba. She had pictures of her in her apartment. So sweet. She had trouble. She wasn't in, in bed like the man, unable to move. She could walk around a little. She got out of breath frequently. Her fingers and toes were always blue because, because of lack of oxygen in her blood. She had to use uh, aerosols frequently. And um, 
one day the agency called me and said uh, she passed away. I was so upset, so upset. I just didn't see it coming. I mean, she had her medication, everything was under control, but she passed away. And uh, you get um, you get attached to people. And if uh, if the cigarettes just killed terrible people that hurt others, okay, but it kills a lot of nice people. It, it's just a, an awful habit. You can always substitute some other habit for it. And um, lots of people are able to just quit just like that and just never touch it again. And there's other ways to quit slowly. Uh, I had one patient told me once that you should go in a hot room, have white sheets on the bed, don't eat any food, and just keep drinking water. And in a few days, all the nicotine will come out of your system. The sheets will be yellow instead of white. And, and that's the way to do it. The same person also said another way to do it was to keep a toothbrush in your mouth all the time instead of the cigarette. Anyway, um, think about it. There's worse things than death, and really worse.